Perspective, welcoming of live, authentic nerdery. I am John Michelle, and tonight we have a very special conversation for you between longtime friends and colleagues, Rachel Pollock and Elisa Quitney, to discuss and celebrate Rachel's groundbreaking 1993 run on Doom Patrol. Uh, why would we do such a thing, you ask? Aside from the plain old fact that it's awesome, I mean, why wouldn't we want to discuss it? But for the first time ever, which is insane, Rachel's brilliantly bizarre and offbeat tenure on the series has been collected into a beautiful hardcover omnibus that even includes Ted McKeever's concluding arc following Rachel. But you are not here to listen to me, Amaron. Without further ado, I give you Elisa Quitney and none other than Rachel Pollock herself. <laughs> Hello, Thanks, Michelle. welcome. Uh, wonderful. Thanks. How uh, how are, how are you both doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, it's I'm... great to be here. I wish we were all in the same space, but it's uh, it's also in nice store. to yeah the, yeah the... in the store next yeah. time. Would that would be actually uh, that would be great if one day we can have like a little studio in the store to do yeah. this kind of a thing. Um, but you know, we're still in the in the after times, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as they really. say. Um, but uh, I mean, I'm I'm gonna do what most of the guys running this country should do and step aside to let the <laughs> brilliant and far more interesting women do their thing. So um, I will um, pop back up um, maybe one or two times to throw some um, uh, kind of a chat questions at you, Rachel. But for the most part, I'm just gonna let the two of you, uh, you know, have have a have a chat. Yeah, thank you. See you, everybody. Hmm. Oh gosh, it's it's you and me. It's you and yeah. me. So mm -hmm. um, I I just want to say, you know, for for those of us who, for those of you watching, um, I was an assistant <coughs> editor and then an editor at Vertigo, uh, which was the mature and funky imprint of DC Comics uh, during the you know, this, this golden period of, of mm -hmm. comics in the nineties and Rachel, you were part of, you know, this incredible creative team producing some really groundbreaking comics. Doom Patrol. I didn't get to edit Doom Patrol. Unfortunately, that was Tom Pyre who shared an office with me and is now the publisher of Ahoy Comics. And I know you've written for them as well. Um, and so just, I'm going to try and give that a uh, tiny bit of background in case anyone doesn't know. Doom Patrol is the most un-superhero superhero team, I would say, of all time. Uh, if, <laughs> if, for those of you who are like, what's Doom Patrol? If you thought the X-Men were sort of quirky outsiders, <laughs> you ain't seen nothing. So I think uh, Grant Morrison uh was the the first writer who sort of took the team and made them really outsiders and and started doing some very trippy and um postmodern kind of storytelling with them and so that's that was a really interesting uh thread to follow it's not you know comics have traditionally had all kinds of stories where one team follows another, but to follow somebody who was breaking all the rules required a whole different mindset. And um, and Rachel, I think your run is only now really getting the recognition that it deserves for you know the what you brought as a writer. So let me just start by asking mm -hmm. about a, a a rumor that many people have heard <laughs> is it true that you got the gig by writing letters to the editor this has persisted ever since i mean it's it's quite amazing to me um that people didn't realize that was a joke um so i'll, I'll tell you first how i got the gig you know um so i had um met neil gaiman and he had really made me aware of all the exciting things going on in comics, you know, Alan Moore particularly, but others. And, and I started reading things, particularly Doom Patrol, which I admired tremendously. I was, I was so excited about it. And, and then Neil and I were at a party. Um, I thought that he'd invited me to some party, but actually we were both there for 
science fiction writers of America, and Tom Pyre told me that. Anyway, um, so I'm at this party, and I'm and I'm mentioning how much uh, you know I like Vertigo, and and Neil introduces me to Stuart Moore, who's a Vertigo editor, and who um, later did Helix, which is a science fiction line, and we did a comic together called Time Breakers. We'll talk about that later, maybe. And anyway, so I was gushing about Doom Patrol and how much I admired uh, Grant Morrison. And he said, well, the editor, Tom Pye, is here. Why don't I introduce you? So I went over to see Tom, and I was all excited. And, you know, I had no thought whatsoever that this might lead to a job, you know? Uh, in fact, I actually said it, what the thing that led to it, which is kind of funny, was to say I wasn't interested in <laughs> writing a monthly comic. Because then I said, but if it ever was, the one I would be so thrilled to write would be Doom Patrol, you know? Mm. Um, and he said, well, actually, um, Grant is leaving. Why don't you write a sample script? And we'll see if that would work. And in his, in his own preface to the Omnibus edition, um, Tom commented that he was actually looking around and couldn't, didn't have anybody. So he was actually delighted that someone was saying that she'd like to do it, you know? Anyway, so um, so I did that, and that's how I got the job. But meanwhile, Grant still had several issues to run, of course, you know? And um, so I wrote a letter to the this column where she knew Tom would be the person who would read it, you know? And the letter was in the voice of this totally geeky kid. <laughs> and it said something like, Wow, wow, Doom Patrol is the coolest comic ever, of all time, ever, ever, ever. It's so great. Grant Morrison is an absolute genius. I love him, I love him. If he ever, if he ever gets sick or dies, can I write it? <laughs> and, oh, and God, that's had, brilliant. And he had to wait, you know, until Tom came across this. In the course of his duties as editor, finally he called me up. He was, he was delighted. He thought it was hilarious. And then he said, we have a few more issues. Why don't you write one a month? And then the <laughs> last one, and the last one, I'll say you got the job, right? Okay. So I, yeah, I did this, and I escalated the letters. You know, I get more aggressive, more demanding. And in my next, in my next the last letter, which ran in Grant's next to last issue, I said, um, you know, um, maybe you think I'm just a kid, but I have friends. You know, how would you like to have, how would you like sugar with your gas tank? How would you like your head stuck in the toilet bowl, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and then my last letter was, oh, gee, Mr. Pye, I'm so, so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I got carried away. The thing is, I told my mom I was already doing it, and she told all her friends. <laughs> so then Tom writes, as his response in the letters column, um, well, there you have it, folks. You know, she told her mother, what can I do? Rachel Pollock is a new writer for Doom Patrol, right? But then in that same issue, in my grown-up, serious voice, I wrote a tribute to Grant Morrison. You know, and you, it was simply so obvious that the letters were a joke, you know, that really silly gee whiz and then, you know, aggressive and then, gee, I'm so, so sorry, gee, miss, you know. Um, but people, I think, just so much loved the idea that you can get a job writing comics simply by writing letters to that comics letters column. And, you know, and I thought, okay, fair enough. You know, because there's some people who don't really know how the publishing industry works, and most people don't, you know, readers, they no, no reason to know that, you know. Um, but then I was at some other kind of reception, and there was, a, there was, I think there was an editor from the Village Voice there, and possibly even a New Yorker. I really, you know, high-level New York people, you know, and they thought I got the job that way. Oh God, that, and thought, it, it was so bizarre, you know. And you know what's coming to my mind now is uh, you and I have both written for Ahoy, which is Tom Pyers. Yeah. Uh, you know, new yeah. publishing imprint and Stuart Moore uh, works there mm -hmm. too. Yeah. And uh, they also are doing uh, a kind of wacky letters to the editor, which I mean, for, for anyone like you, like me, who's loved comics yeah. back from yeah. the seventies, yeah. yeah. um, seeing these letters, to the editor is wonderful. And yeah. uh, I, I love, I love the fact that you created this whole mystique around it. And um and it's it's kind of even better than true that you were in on on creating this. It's very uh, kind of postmodern in its own way. Yeah, you know there is actually a famous editor who um, first began by writing letters to comics. Her name was Cat Ironwood, and she's now for years been a teacher of hoodoo uh, magic. But she used to edit. Um, she was the editor in chief of Eclipse Comics, was it? I think. But she used to write letters and. Uh, more to Marvel, I think. But I remember when I'd get the issue that she would write to, I would look at her letters before reading the issue. They were so oh, wonderful and brilliant. You know? 
Well, I, I wish I had. I, I did the answers to the Sandman letter column, and I still thought, you know, God, that's going to yeah. be on my epitaph. But um, all right. <laughs> so let me let me ask you, um, you know, what was it about the structure that Grant created with Doom Patrol's unusual superhero team that appealed to you? What, you know, right from the start, did you know what you wanted to explore in terms of themes, in terms of characters? What I loved was the outrageousness of it. Not just the characters, but the villains, certainly, and the plots, you know? And they were so surreal. And I have to say that one of the things I admired so much about him was he found the perfect balance between completely outrageous surreal and accessibility. It took me a while to, to find that sweet spot, as you might say. And I'm, I imagine some people will feel I never found it. But, but um, so I like that very much. And those people are wrong. <laughs> OK, thank so. you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I've read that he said, and this is what I've read. I've not ever had that direct from him. But I read somewhere that, that he had read that people were saying that now that uh, Alan Moore done Watchmen, no one could ever do a, a, a team comic again. Because Alan had taken all the way to the end, and that was it. No one else, and he was so outraged by this that if there was anything that was closed off to creativity, mm. he decided to just do it his way. And I know that he had gone to art school, so he was influenced by you know um, 20th century surrealist art movements and other kinds of avant-garde art movements. And so a lot of that's in there, particularly his story, The Painting of the Day Paris is totally about modern art movements and brilliant. And so I really liked that he was so outrageous, so over the top and so funny too. And so that's kind of what I was aiming for. But I also was aiming to um, take certain things that he'd kind of hinted at and bring them more to the forefront. And those things had to do with um, people's sexualities, their repressions, um, their feelings of being uh, outsiders and feeling ashamed about this. Uh, a lot of people were struggling with those kind of things at that time, you know? And, so I, I really wanted to delve into that. And so um, and so some of the things that like Cliff goes through, Robot Man, were things that Grant had kind of looked at a little bit, but I really brought to the surface his feeling of shame about not being a human being anymore, about being a, you know, a machine with a brain. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the single issues comics I did, and I love doing those. When I was first approached to do one, I would, no, I don't want to do that. You know, I, I want the multi-arc, multi-story arc ones. But yeah. Anyway, and but when I did all three of them were things I really loved doing, um, and one of them was called Bootleg Steel, and that's about um, you know the, the idea was that um, that Cliff's brain was being downloaded into something or other, and then so he was put into a robot body. And I forget the exact art. This is back in Grant's time. Anyway, but so there was there were these um, tapes back way back then. Of course, it was tapes, you know, uh, what his brain contents. So my idea was that someone had stolen those and was manufacturing cheap runoff robot man. And they'd be really clumsily made, but and they speak in a very stilted way, but they were basically versions of him. And because they were like basically bootleg games, you know, that people were doing and and so you know he finds this out and then he feels you know he's angry but he also feels this great shame mm -hmm. because he feels like that's all he is you know and at that point he'd already been connected to kate uh, who was a transgender woman transgender lesbian superhero that i introduced in issue 70 and um anyway so um so she like bolsters them up because of course as a as a trans woman, her identity was always being challenged as fake. It's, it's just, you know, it's nonsense, you know, that she could claim she's a woman. It's just all in her head kind of thing. And, uh, and so she says to him, um, you have to deep, go dig down deep into yourself, Cliff, all the way and say to yourself, you know, I'm Cliff Steele and I'm a human being. And this is what he does. And he just comes back to himself. And they go in and they smash the factory where all these bootleg steel things are being made. And then they're leaving, and the guy who runs the factory says, you know, why are you so high and mighty? You're no different than any of them. You're the same as them. You're just a, you know, a brain inside a box, you know? 
And Cliff turns to him and says, no, there's one big difference, you know. He says, um, I'm a human being and they're not. <laughs> well, no, know, he, says, he says, they're machines and I'm not. Something like that, yeah. So I that, love this. that's the kind of thing I wanted to bring out, you know, that. I, that I love this and it's, I just, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just have to say, I think we need this these stories more than ever before. I was just, you know, listening to some of the um, hearings for Ketanji Jackson, uh, who's the nominee for the Supreme Court. And she was asked, can you define a woman? And I'm, you know, finding myself thinking, wow, you know, there are people who are so very eager to put yeah. people into boxes yeah. that are not the boxes by which, you know, they want to be put in. And, what did she say, uh, by the way? Do, do you remember? Do you know, I couldn't bring was? myself to listen. I, I thought I, I just began to tune it out because I, yeah. I felt I felt I just I don't know. Yeah, you're right. I, I find that a lot of these things I prefer to have in fiction and with humor because yeah, to yeah. get slammed into yeah. the the nasty culture war side of it yeah. um is is just too finger on the on the raw spot so actually Gosh. that leads me to i'm gonna just show um also the image to your first issues cover mm -hmm. um was this was this uh who did this cover is this it looks like brian bolland it's brian yeah, bolland yeah. here isn't that Incredible beautiful cover? artist. Yeah, I you know he. Had, I guess he had the script and everything, and um, but really it was just you know him. Uh, just can he, I and can, just can you? Thing, you know? I just want to ask you two things. So first, I want to ask you who these characters are, and don't let me forget. I want to talk about handling issues like uh, gender identity, like like identity in general with humor. So, but let's just start for a second looking at who these characters are. Can you describe who you're seeing here? Well, you know, I'm not even 100% sure actually. Because <laughs> <laughs> certainly the, the, the character down in the front next to Dorothy, Dorothy's on our left looking at it. Um, and uh, so she's the one who was a great, great grand character. And she has imaginary friends who all come to life but have, but have superpowers, but because she is so isolated and so alone and has had no social, um, what's the word where you, you grow for having social contact? Uh, socialization. So, socialization. Yeah, socialization. Um, so all her, all her imaginary friends are bizarre and weird. And they all have bizarre, weird superpowers. So the, the figure with the doll head and the sexy body of the woman, um, I think that's one of her, do her imaginary friends. And I'm not entirely clear who the oh, woman I, is. <laughs> so it's so Okay, it's I'm to... sorry, I should not have asked you this way. I forget. Somebody was asking me about stuff I've written. I'm like, I've written too much. I don't remember. Yeah. But then but then the figure in the background um, on the cover, um, I'm pretty sure that's one of the probably one of the sexual remaindered spirits, one of the ghosts that so one of the things I did was I just thought, well, you know, Doom Patrol they're really weird. The whole thing about them is they're totally bizarre and strange. And so, um, when, how about if they move to the suburbs? <laughs> how about if the new mash is a house somewhere in the suburbs? Actually, it was basically Rhinebeck. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so that's, that's, that's hysterical. I didn't so realize actually, it was yeah, Rhinebeck. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually, living in Doom Patrol territory. Yeah. Actually, the really strange thing about this um, is that. You know, I sent for reference of what I meant by the kind of house I meant. I sent a photograph to Tom, my editor, you know, and he gave us the artist. The artist did that house. Oh, I <laughs> and I was it. so frightened that uh, the people who lived in that house would find out. <laughs> and we'd all get in trouble, but there was never any feedback from it. So I guess that was okay. And, yeah. So I've I've just been showing some images. The the artist here is uh, Richard Case, yeah. and was the Stan Walk was the the inker. Yeah, I was so delighted that Richard stayed on for my first arc, because as far as I remember, I believe that he was the artist of Grant the entire run of Grant. They didn't switch over different artists like they did with most people, you know. Yeah, like pretty yeah. much everybody. It's, I just but um, it's the only time I can think of for they had a fairly long run that the same artist as well as the same writer. But anyway, but um, so, and so, you know, I've, 
one of the things I did that caused some problems with some of the fans, well, because I realized I read about this in my introduction, is that um, I think that people in the comics world who back then were mostly young men, and they had a kind of almost unacknowledged Freudian idea about how a new writer takes over a comic. And this is, you kill everything before you. You conquer it. You overthrow the father. You do something totally different, you know. Or you slavishly follow the father, you know. And I didn't, and to me, my idea, and I, you know, I don't come off too feminist, but basically my idea is that it's a more female way to do it, is to build on the previous thing yeah. without being a slave to it. So that's what I was done without even thinking about. That's what I wanted to do. I didn't particularly think about how do you do something like this. You know, I just did it. And so I took a lot of what Grant did, but I took it in a different direction. And people had a lot of problems with that. They actually complained that I was actually doing that, that I wasn't either overthrowing it or doing something completely slavishly following him. Um, if you're going to follow him, you should do it just like him. It was weird. But I, I say that because the first issue, the first story arc, actually, was really copying his first story arc. And even the title, um, I think he called his first rising from the wreckage, I call mine crawling from the wreckage, I meaning they were worse off even than the first time. <laughs> so, so that's the kind of, you know, so that's kind of how I was doing it. And so all the weird stuff you're holding up are things that are just from that situation where they're trying to reconnect back to reality. Mm -hmm. And um, I forget his name, that the, the doctor from the metal men, um, he was helping them. That he helped them in the beginning of Grant's first yeah. Grant story arc, you know, um, but just taking it to bizarre, more bizarre stretches and just more well, outrageous images, kind of thing. So I, I want to talk with you a bit about humor and how you use humor well, I, um, Michelle, to I deal think, with. Jean Michelle wants to ask something. Yes, yes. So let's just let's table that for the moment. <laughs> yeah, uh, hey guys, I just wanted to interrupt for a second, just because um, you kind of mentioned. Uh, briefly about um, how back then, you know, it was kind of like a, a boys club, which uh, we have uh, a question from somebody that kind of mentions that. Okay. Uh, so from David Dorsian, it says back in the 90s, comics was still pretty much a boys club. And then DC made the brilliant decision to give Karen Berger her own imprint to yeah. Shepard. Uh, what was it like being on the ground floor of Vertigo Comics back then? So that that's uh, a question from the uh, from the cheap seats. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, excellent. Elisa, you are more an insider than me, so I can I can speak as someone coming into it. Well, I'll but I'll start you, by clarifying yeah. how what I th think about. So the idea that they gave Karen an imprint, I I think I would just sort of fine tune that a little because okay. it wasn't like they you know, Karen was doing something else and they said, here's your mandate, do this. It was that Karen's aesthetic, the the people she was choosing to edit and to write and to draw had a very different look and feel than um, the other comics that were being published by DC. And so Sandman and Shade the Changing Man and Doom Patrol and Animal Man, everything that that you know was she was editing and her editors that she'd hired were editing had this different feel and so the imprint became mm -hmm. a sort of you know official way of creating a structure to contain this difference that already existed and and Karen did really want to nurture other voices um and and it's you know she she did definitely uh, want to hire women and people who who might not have had as much of a chance. Yeah. So I just wanted to say that. So but you know yeah, Rachel, what was it like for you? We're coming into the world of comics, which was a more masculine readership, but of course Vertigo itself um, included. Well, at that point there was Karen, there was me. I'm, I don't remember if it was Shelley. I don't uh, know if she, there. She, if she came in at the beginning or not. She was a bit later. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. And also Tom. I'm not sure if Tom Pyre. I guess he was because he, yeah, he was editing Doom Patrol. So he was from before and 
after. Tom was her assistant editor before me. So yeah, he predated yeah. me. Let's say he was um, editing Doom Patrol Grants, and that was before Vertigo. And he stayed on with me in Vertigo. So yeah, so he Tom bridged the gap very much. Yeah. And I shared an office with Tom. And oh, right. so when you came in, I would have been definitely there. We were both smokers in those days. Oh my gosh. Wow. And so do you remember our office often smelled like smoke? No, I don't remember. <laughs> Well, we had, okay, so they confused our room with the computer room. And so it had really <laughs> powerful ducts. And, but yeah, so we were, we were a smokering office. I don't know. Anyway, so what was it like for you, Rach? Well, you know, I did not have that much contact with the company. So I really was dealing primarily with Tom Pyre. Um, and I, and I, I knew that we had the support of Karen and Vertigo, but there wasn't a lot of sense of, um, you know, how you uh, navigate, the, the whole idea of a, an, an imprint did not affect me that much personally. I was doing what I was doing. But the one way in which we had some of those kind of things was from some of the fan reactions. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned before, some of them felt I was doing it wrong. But, you know, there are others who, well, that's, you know, the famous continuity uh, police. You know, one person in particular, you know, we would do something, and he would say, well, yeah, back in issue uh, three, uh, <laughs> in 1962, whatever it was, I mean, it was kind of a bit, a bit, you know, much. And so but we just kind of dealt with that, you know, and, and we just kept doing what we were doing. And at the same time, you know, the great thing about working for Vertigo, Vertigo was that there was no pressure to do things in a more commercial way, um, you know, the editor, it was the editor's job to make it work. And yeah. when Lou came on, uh, no, I was his name was Stathis, and I heard someone say Lou Stathis. Do you know how Stathis. was that pronounced? It was Stathis. Stathis. Okay, that was right. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, when he became the editor, part of his job was to sort of slap me around a bit and have me be less self-indulgent and have things be more accessible. And I think it was great. You know, Tom was so wonderful in his, you know, wild inspiration. Uh, and then Lou was great in his just belief in what I was doing, but feeling that we have to, we have to make it so that you know people can go along with it a bit more. I just, I just want to say that they were both like characters. I mean, Tom with his wild curly hair was always yeah. wearing uh, Hawaiian shirts in those days, oh. <laughs> and uh, and smoking and and kind of wonderfully messy. And then Lou, who had this quality about him of like. Um, I don't know, almost like a, a grouchy philosophical Larry David quality. Is that yeah? yeah? And then yeah, there, there you know, and then you would come in, there. Rachel, and and you were this other character in that you know you <laughs> would come in with these beautiful flowing silk, you know, tuniky <laughs> outfits with oh like goddess earrings and jangly <laughs> bracelets. And you know, so it was it was such a, a wonderful clash of cultures. Yeah. I have a great Tom Pye story to tell you, which is it was such a sweet thing he did. So at that time, I was dating someone who had a little boy. He was like four or so, I guess, you know, maybe, maybe five at the most. And he, someone had given him, or his mother had given him a Superman costume. You know, and he just loved it. He wanted to wear it all the time. And he wouldn't ask to do his name. He would ask only to Superman, you know. And so, and I, I, of course, thought this was so cool. You know, I was happy to always call him Superman, stuff like this. And at that time, DC had their... Move, I think they just moved into their pretty glam offices in Manhattan. Yeah. And, oh, the yeah, super. And the, the lobby had swanky a special Superman figure coming out of the wall as if he's yes. flying free of the wall. I don't know how they did that, how they anchored it in the wall so beautifully in full flight. So I said to Tom, Look, can I bring my friend's little boy here? He'll love that, you know? And so, and so he said, Yes, you know, and, um, and so, you know, we only told him, my, my girlfriend and I, that we were going to show him something special, you know? And we, so we go take him there, and, he, and he's like gasping in amazement, you know? And, you know? and then Tom came out and just gave him a complete tour of the entire place, you know, and showed him all kinds of Clark Kent memorabilia and Superman memorabilia. And that was so sweet, you know? He took, a, you know, quite a good part of his day off to just do that, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes, but he was that kind of guy, you know. He was and is 
an amazing yeah. and yeah. fun yeah. person. Um, and yeah. and the offices were this cool place. They were they were you know Batman and Soup. Clark Kent was sitting in the waiting yeah, room Clark area was, where you would I, sit. I, and then you come in and see him too. Yeah, you didn't know that was there. You just see this guy sitting there. You went, wait, that's Clark Kent. In a suit. Yeah, that's yeah. Wonderful. No, it was it was. There, were, there was such a playfulness about yeah. the offices. Yeah. Um, okay. Speaking of playfulness, um, so I, I have two questions. I, I want to talk about another issue, and I, I also wanted to ask if you got any pushback um, from—I mean, not from Karen, but from anyone at DC for writing a transgender character. So this was the first issue, a single issue, you know. And I, as I said, I really wasn't wild about it. I thought, what am I going to do? You know, what should I do? has to be a single issue, right? Okay. And they came up with this really ridiculous villain. He called himself Codpiece. And um, his his super uh, villainy thing was he had a kind of cannon attached to his groin with super weapons, you know? And basically what this was, was it was a takeoff on 1950s, maybe 60s, Green Arrow, who was just uh -huh. the most ridiculous character because Green Arrow had his, you know, <laughs> yeah, his super arrows and his quiver. So he had this like thin little quiver, and then that quiver contains fireworks arrows, boxing glove arrows. <laughs> and so it's just great. so totally absurd, you know? And um, anyway, so, uh, so I thought, oh, how does make a character like that? But of course, I wanted it to be, you know, the kind of thing I did, right? So I just came up with this guy, and, um, and his issue, his problem, well, it begins in high school, and he's very nerdy and kind of doesn't know how to be around girls, you know. And he's so asked that girl to go out, and she says that she doesn't want to go out with him, you know. Or maybe she doesn't want to go on a second date with him, something like that. Yeah, you can see the kind of things we did. And anyway, so, um, and he says, well, why not? She says, oh, because you're too small. And she walks away. And then her friend says, why did she say to him? She says, oh, I don't know, whatever came to my mind. And that's it for her. For him, this... His whole life is dominated by this terrible trauma. He thinks that she was saying his penis is too small, even though my idea was she had never seen it, you know. <laughs> um, and then, this so is, oh, I just I have to point out this. By the way, the artist here is uh, Scott Eden, inked by Tom Sutton. Here he's what it's it's like he's MacGyvering with his schmeckle. Yeah, schmeckle ivory. <laughs> schmeckle ivory. Yes, yeah. So. Anyway, so anyway, so he decides finally he's going to show them all. And he says, too small, am I? So he, he comes up with this weapon attached to his body, you know? Anyway, so in, but in the process of that, what triggered for me was an issue of people feeling ashamed of who they are and people feeling like they can't go out into the world. And this was a Doom Patrol theme. Mm -hmm. so, so the first thing I did was I had um, my characters, George and Mary and the people in bandages, who have no bodies at all. Every, everyone had a problem with their bodies. You know, Cliff had a robot body. Dorothy had what she thought was an ugly body. George and Marion had no body. They were just energy beings wrapped in bandages. Had to have a bandaged character. Anyway, and so they're going off for a day in the city, all, all bandages and clothing, you know. And then Dorothy um, says, how, how can you stand it, you know? But they ask Dorothy and Cliff if they want to come. And they oh, no, no, I, I'll stay here, you know. And then Clarby says, how can you stand it? Said, what do you mean? Said, well, everyone's just staring at you all the time. And you know they, they're thinking weird stuff about you. I don't remember the exact dialogue, but something like that. And then, um, and then George and Marion said, well, we think we have two choices. One is to um, stay home and be frightened and never go out. And the other is to ignore them all and have a good time. And we think the choice is easy. So, so they're among the people. But then I came up with this idea that um, the opposite person to Codpiece might be, uh, there they are, George and Marion, they're very stylish clothes. <laughs> and the and, bandages, yeah. Yeah, and bandages, absolutely, yeah. And, um, you know, I, th I thought that since Codpiece's whole issue is being ashamed of himself and ashamed of his sexuality, um, I should have someone who's overcome shame. And it, for the many transgender people at that time, you know, the big issue was overcoming society's Feeling we should be ashamed of ourselves and pass and all these other kinds of terrible things. So I just invented this character. Now, also at that time, um, as soon as I, I was going to a support group for trans women, which was very, trying to be quite a powerful group, actually. 
Um, anyway, and one of the women was a love comics, you know. So when she heard I was doing a comic, she said, "Oh, oh, can I be a character? I've always wanted to be a superhero." But okay, so I'll make her a character, right? Okay. So she introduced this character, Kate, Kate Godwin, and um, she's talking to some friends of hers in uh, this lesbian bar, and um, and talking about when she was that that being a superhero. And she has this funny kind of power. She can her left hand can dissolve things, her right hand coagulates them. Um, because she she got that from having sex with um Larry, which was one of Grant's characters who had alchemical qualities anyway. Um and so, you know, and they say to her, So did you ever like, you know, did you ever were have a superhero identity? She said, Well, I tried to join the um, Justice League and um I even gave myself a superhero named Coagula, you know? And to this day, people still call the character Coagula, even though that name was used very, very rarely in the comic. They just called her Kate. Anyway, um, and so we see her in this ridiculous costume in this flashback. And then she um, then she said, but they didn't want me. I, I don't think it was my powers. I think it was me they had trouble with. <laughs> and then she says, so I guess I'll just be who I am. And at that point, the, uh, the panel focuses on her jacket, and on her jacket's a button that says, put a transsexual lesbian on the Supreme Court. And so that's how we knew her identity, right? So she goes, and she's the one to challenge codpiece, who just sees this in the street, this disaster. And so, of course, her left hand dissolves this cannon, and her right hand coagulates into this, this lumpy mess. So... I guess I should have seen that some boys <laughs> and some men would have trouble with this image. <laughs> but you know, to me, it was so ridiculous and so surreal and funny. It didn't occur to me people would take it in any kind of personal way. But we did get some, you know, some complaints about that. But then people said to me, um, I said, well, did they give you any problems of having a transgender character, you know, as a superhero? And I said, no, no, because their, their concern was with God peace. Where they'd get into trouble with obscenity rules. So what they said, I, what they said to, um, you know, I think I can't remember if it was Lou. I think it might have been Lou already. I'm not sure. You know, um, I asked Tom about this, and, and I think no, Tom wasn't even sure. I think, but anyway, but um, I, I'd have to get the cut issue out and look it up. But anyway, but um, what they said to the editor was, um, well, okay, we talked of legal, and you can have this character, but the canon can't be too long. <laughs> oh it's god so I, it's but so you know funny. i mean again and again you're using humor and and yet the humor yeah. has authentic emotion and issues in it um so i wanted to mention i read an article i'm trying to remember i think it was in the atlantic uh yeah. and the author was jude de luca 2020 okay. and jude uh says that Grant's themes were normalcy versus weirdness. Okay. Your themes were stagnation versus growth. Would, would you agree with that? I, I do think that because some of the some of the villains, particularly the the builders, as they were called, which is an idea I took from a, a fur away from Grant. Um, the idea is the villains that they were trying to actually you know keep things from ever changing. Mm -hmm. They didn't want things to be ever new. And so they really, that's a good, that's a good observation, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, I tended to think about it as my theme was, um, you know, people self-acceptance to a large extent. Mm -hmm. um, but that idea is a good one, actually. That, that from Judah well, Lucas, sometimes yeah, our, our readers, acute readers, will see, you know, oh, yeah, things that absolutely. we ourselves didn't even see. Always. Um, you, know, you can count on it, I think, you know. I also, okay, so I want to mention some of the other artists. First of all, there's this amazing uh, cover here. This was, mm -hmm. I believe, Tom Taggart, right? He would send in these 3D sculptures, yeah, uh, yeah. which we got to see in the, sometimes, I mean, he would photograph them. Uh, Linda Medley and Graham Higgins yeah. uh, are the team here. So we had a woman artist as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, I just wanted, and then, you know, we uh ended also uh with ted mckeever as the artist who went on oh, to, to write yeah. oh, love this yeah um love this his style 
mm-hmm. is very abstract. And, you know, that's another thing with Doom Patrol that, you know, if people were looking for a certain kind of more commercial art, you know, where the <laughs> women were busty and the oh, heroes were. Vertigo you know, in general, this... though. Vertigo was very good about that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And but Ted McKeever's art, it it just I mean, it's wonderful. Yeah. It's very yeah. abstract. And um I so I'm just trying to give a smattering. Okay, so one of the other things that I want to make sure ah, I need to plug my computer in. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Uh, suddenly I'm looking and it says your Mac is low. So I'm just gonna just <laughs> plug plug it in there. I'm mean, going to say something more about Kate, if, we, if it's okay. Yeah, please, please, um, absolutely. So something happened to me that was so interesting, and, and I think the, the omnibus coming out now is maybe connected to this, this this movement. So I thought that basically, you know, it was years ago, right? It was like 90s, you know, so I thought, okay, we, it was great at the time. If people, Some people, other people didn't, and it was kind of in the past, you know? And I got invited to um, be a keynote speaker at the world's first transgender literary conference at a, a university in Ottawa, uh, not Ottawa, yeah. I'm sorry, um, in Western Canada. And um, and I thought this was great, you know, wonderful. And I got there and I, and I thought about, you know, I had written some articles on transgender issues in the past. I'd had, you know, a little bit of stuff and, you know, Doom Patrol, but that was years and years ago, you know? And I was wondering why they invited me even. Um, and I got there and I found out that I was a hero to a lot of these people, mm-hmm. particularly the young generation of trans care people doing comics, you know, personal comics, mostly and online, but doing comics, you know, and it was all because of Kate. And this was a really wonderful thing. You know, it was so thrilling to see that you do something that's a bit outrageous and outside the mainstream and, but you do it with dedication and commitment yeah. and it, it, people get it. And you might not even know that, you know? But we used to get some amazing letters, actually, uh, from, from people about how much Doom Patrol meant to them. Yeah. Absolutely. And it was just uh, not a part of the general conversation. I mean, these days, mm-hmm. I think there's much more awareness. And yeah. there's, of course, all the weirdness about J.K. Rowling and, oh, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and some of the so less you know? fortunate reactions. But I mean, in the 90s, I don't rem- remember it being as much a part of the general conversation. And so I think bringing, you know, it's very hard, I think, for people to not ha- see themselves reflected in literature or in art or, you know, so, so to have that and to have it be playful as well as emotionally resonant you know, would, say would have been better. so big. Yeah. I was talking further about that and about J.K. Rowling's too. You know, she did this horrible, horrible thing about you know coming out against trans kids and trans people, um, and then when she was criticized, she just doubled down and became even nastier. Mm-hmm. You know, and wrote a whole mystery novel in which there's a transgender villain. It was creepy as hell. Anyway, but there were some very powerful letters, you know, to her from young trans people who said how betrayed they felt. Mm-hmm. And a couple of people said, you were the only thing that kept me alive when I was young. Basically, they meant they, would, they did not commit suicide because there was Harry Potter. Mm. You know? And we got a letter like that. It was the most amazing letter in the letters column. And it, was, it was just, it's just no preamble. It just started right in saying something like, all my life I thought I was wrong. And how she said how she would pray every night to be exchanged into a girl, but God never did it. And she wanted to kill herself, but wasn't, didn't have the courage, you know? And he said, and now um, because, of, because of you and Kate, I now, and because of the, th- the reactions of people who I dare to tell, speak to, I now know for the first time it's possible to have a life. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, and I remember showing that to people at GC headquarters, because I, I went there and I got all the letters, you know, because the letters were handwritten back then. There was no email back then, amazingly enough, hard to believe. Anyway, and, um, so I got that and I read it, you know, and I took it to a couple of people and I didn't even say, I just handed it to them. I didn't say a word, you know, and one or two that I remember would start crying. Yeah. yeah. You know, because they were so overwhelmed and they knew it wasn't just because they would have this great effect on some young person, you know, I knew it was because we worked in comics, which was the most despised medium, 
you know, of any possible art kind of medium at that time. Yeah, it was, you know? it was considered very throwaway at that trash, time. Trash, throwaway trash, you know? And every now and then, I'll get a letter now and then that begins like, you know, saying, no, I know that when you, you write your Doom Patrol was not the most important part of your writing. And, I'll write, and I say, no, you're wrong. It was absolutely at the very top of my writing experiences because it was something so, I felt was valuable to do, was exciting and also important. You know? Absolutely. And I just want to say, you know, for um, anyone who was a fan of Harry Potter and, and feels mm. uh, upset and abandoned, I think, you know, in the end, Harry Potter is ours now. Yes, <laughs> no I longer J.K. Rowling's. So, yeah, yeah. you know, once it's out in the world, it belongs yeah. Yeah. to the readers um so speaking of of stories that are out in the world i mean your other identity besides as a, a wonderful writer of <laughs> novels short stories poetry you're also a tarot expert and i wanted to ask you a little bit about how um your your tarot figures into your storytelling or does it well that's very much but to a large extent it does as a low-key kind of way uh, to me, they're the same kind of thing. Um, I'm actually writing a memoir. Um, I finally finished the first draft. It'll still be quite a while before it's ready. But it's called And On the Way I Told a Tale, My Life in Tarot, Storytelling, and Magic. Um, mm -hmm. And so I decided, because I'm doing, um, if you go to my Facebook page, you'll see this thing I'm doing in about two and a half weeks. If this, this will come out in time for that. Anyway, um, it's I'm doing a, presentation online about the memoir. And I want to think of, you know, an image that will um, sort of resonate with how those things fit together. So, you know, tarot, magic, and storytelling. And uh, I both actually have one, and I'm wearing it right now. I'll hold it up. So it's the Caduceus of the God Hermes. So two snakes wound around a staff, and at the top of it's wings and, and light. So the two snakes are tarot and um, and um, and magic, and this and this and the thing in between is stories. So storytelling to me is, is the essence of everything. Um, but my tarot stuff is also I use tarot for my novel writing, and for my stories I do, I'll do I'll do cards to get inspiration for um stories and, oh you have and, your jack stories which i particularly love yeah okay. um, i know that's, that we're not, stories, yeah. yeah um i i just need to you know mention to anyone who's listening and watching that you know obviously you you know your comic stuff is incredible and please you know buy the doom patrol omnibus but uh, don't stop there you know rachel is an amazing uh short story writer her inventiveness her playfulness her um the poetry that shines through it, it's you know you're you're a wonderful writer and storyteller thanks yeah thank you very much um so let me let me uh are there any more audience questions otherwise i have um another couple of questions hello Hi, John. hello <laughs> um there was actually one more uh, audience question. Um, if you could change anything about the comic book industry, what would it be? Oh my gosh! Wow. Um, <laughs> well, I, I'm tempted to put on my um, feminist hat and to say once and for all to people to know that women's bodies are not contorted, huge breasts and huge asses. <laughs> um, there's one comic I did. I did one mainstream DC comic. I won't even say now what it was. Um, but I loved doing it, except I hated the artist that they got to do it, you know. And um, my joke was they said, um, I would have quit and protested if they hadn't fired me. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, they fired, they, fired, they fired the entire staff because someone else wanted to take it over, whatever. Anyway, but um, so there's that. But you know, it's hard for me to say because I, I don't follow the industry that closely at the moment. Um, so I'm not sure. I think I'd like to see, I feel like some of the vertigo kind of like wild, just fun stuff, it's not quite there in the same way. I, am I, I mean, would you say that's true? That's kind of yeah. safer now? I, I think what I would say is there was this golden period where there yeah. were more and more creator-owned rights uh, being granted to people. And so uh, 
creative uh, teams were being given more ownership, you know, over the characters they created and um, and more stake in, in what they were doing. And I think that has kind of gone in the opposite direction uh, more okay. recently. Yeah. So that would be that would be my response. Well, I mean, to think, but I know that the Doom Patrol was not creator owned. Animal Man was, I don't think, was creator owned. But yet the editor editorial policy was to give a chance to, yeah. you know, really wild, wild stuff, you know. And I think it found an audience. It wasn't perhaps the audience they would have liked. Um, one reason, <laughs> um, one reason my run of Doom Patrol ended was they felt they didn't have the numbers. You know, it wasn't selling as well as they wanted. Um, and I've been told, I don't know if this is even true, but I've been told that all subsequent versions of it had less readership than mine. So really? it wasn't me so much. It was just the market declining. Yeah. You know? And I think it was... I've been told, you know? I mean, it, it, what you were doing was interesting and different. And, you know, it, it sometimes... You know, who knows what it is that makes something hit and sometimes something hits afterwards. But, I mean, I think that the trippy, um, sexually playful, positive uh, spirit of your yeah. um, shamanistic spirit. You know, you were the one who taught me that Tiresias and gender shifting was always associated with shamanic powers. Yeah. And I think that that wild energy in, infuses your run on Doom Patrol. And I, I just so much hope that people get a chance to pick that up and read it. Yeah, absolutely. Just, just, let me just strike me what you were saying about my inspiration going all the way back. Um, mm -hmm. Since I'm very, very old, <laughs> I was lucky to <laughs> be, have been able to see a couple of years or so, I guess, of the original Captain Marvel before DC put it out of business with the lawsuit for plagiarism, which is ridiculous. I mean, everyone agrees that that judge didn't know what he was talking about. But anyway, um, and Captain Marvel had that kind of wild, funny, playful use of mythology, which even as a kid, I didn't quite get. You know, I love that, you know, I got this ridiculous, you know, the word Shazam was a uh, strength of um, Hercules or something, you know, this absurd. Those, kind of those original Captain Marvel comics were bonkers oh, they like, were amazing. They, they, were bonkers. like they were really fun they were really fun wild but they were connected to stuff because one of the things i loved is whenever the character was, whenever character would be surprised i go holy moly which was just a funny line you know and then i was reading something and moly's from the odyssey and uh -oh. when, when odysseus has to face the um the sorceress uh, circe who turns yeah. men into animals or magic potions um and Hermes, the god of magic, says, um, there's a plant called moly. You eat that, you'll be immune. Oh, and my so, God, I so, love I've that. I've never yeah. known so, that. So, so the people from um, all the way back in Captain Marvel were doing this kind of vertical-like thing, doing a genuinely based in Greek mythology, but wild, bunkers, just hilarious kind of stuff. That's really cool. I'm going to start saying holy moly. This I is it. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're bringing it back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so I, so, I told some of my, my friends who, you know, do plant stuff. They said, yeah, holy moly is a real, pl moly is a real plant. Yeah. Oh, that's neat. So yeah, uh, is, uh, I have a question for the two of you, because as I said uh, in the intro, uh, you've both known each other for a really long time. You've uh, been friends and colleagues for quite a while. And I was just wondering if um, you remember the first time that you met and and like kind of how how that came about well <laughs> no because we're old. not exactly clear you know <laughs> but you know i just no. i remember you coming into the offices i remember meeting you and talking with you and you being just one of the cool people you always were magical you know you came in like a priestess and <laughs> um and then you know when i moved to rhinebeck um, uh, we just, you know, for a while we were part of the same writers group. Um, yeah. Rachel has brought her, um, brilliant, uh, priestess wisdom to Passover satyrs, uh, because, well, you know, I love doing those with you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I know it's, um, and I don't even know what I'm doing this year because life is in shift, yeah. but, yeah. uh, but yeah, no, it's, uh. 
you have just been a magical friend for me and I'm, you know, and I, I love when I go into a certain cafe and see you writing with your yeah, glorious I fountain know. pen. Always one of my favorite things, like going out to get some breakfast or grab a coffee <laughs> know, and then I walk in and I'm like, oh, there's Rachel. Like, I know, you know walk the like, walk on the street. I yeah. see you sometimes with your kids, you know? Yeah, I love um, that. I, I, I have two theories how we met. Um, either when I first started working at Vertigo and we met there, or we were both FON, Friends of Neil. Friends of Neil, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a real possibility, actually. Yeah, that's true. Him, I met him before he was doing comics. He wanted, he was already friends with Alan, but he was writing He was writing science fiction, and that's how we met through those circles. And, and apparently oh, wow. Duran Duran, Duran Duran, Duran, uh, Duran, Duran, biographies <laughs> also yeah. yeah and he actually he actually told me once that he he interviewed me before before he met at the writers conference i didn't remember that because he was a yeah. journalist as you probably know um, yeah you know, sort of a hip journalist writing for like men's magazines and cool magazines and stuff like this and um i had published the book for salvador dali's tarot deck and apparently oh, he cool. interviewed me and i i don't remember all i remember is uh being interviewed by uh, someone from the Guardian newspaper in England, think how cool that was. Except there was a hatchet shop. It was the nastiest oh. article I next interview I ever did. Well, the British can specialize in that. It was really, it's, it's, really, it's their blood sport. Yeah, it was. It was a hatchet <laughs> shop. It was a setup. I had no idea. I'm, I've yeah. always been naive that way, kind of. You know. Well, I always think people's people's motives are pure. That's <laughs> and the, and that's how they get you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, before we go, I wanted to ask uh, each of you um, if you have anything to plug, if you have uh, stuff that you want uh, the world to know that you're doing okay. that they should check out. Well, first of all, I want to say that uh, we put my website up you know, for people. It's, yep. it's, it's in the process of greatly needing revision. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a fair amount of it's out of date, I have to. So, so if people want to find out what I'm doing now, there's also a good Wikipedia page which gives more comprehensive bibliographical information. But also, um, they go to my, they come, they can follow my Facebook page. I'm pretty much full up for new people, but they can just like, I put. They can, they I'm can still up. follow your page. Though. Yeah. I can go um, my Rachel, page. Yeah. are you teaching at Omega Institute? Yes. Yeah. Two things coming up. So, um, this summer, the last weekend and then week of July. I will be teaching for my 32nd year at oh, the wow. Institute just outside of Rhinebeck. And I've been doing it with this woman named Mary Greer, who's a wonderful person, a superb, superb teacher and writer. And we've been doing it all this time. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. Cool. And there'll be three other teachers at the beginning. It's, it's a great thing. So it's eomega.org. Very easy to find. Just look at the index on the tarot and there'll be. Um, and then, um, and not just two weeks from this coming Sunday, I'm doing uh, something called morbidanatomy.org. Isn't that a great new Morbid Anatomy? Oh. They're an amazing organization. Yeah. Anyway, we have done, I've done several classes with them. So I'm doing one about my memoir, about story and magic and tarot. Oh, cool. That's awesome. And, uh, oh, God, that's fantastic. So I'll have people to check that out. That is, yeah, it's, it's, they're, they're great fun. They do. They're great people. And, um, Phenomenal. Yeah. So um, that's current things I'm doing. And then, of course, Doom Patrol is coming out. And then um, in September, I think it is, September 22nd, actually, um, a book of mine called A Walk Through the Forest of Souls, which is its original title, mm -hmm. the first edition cut the title down. Um, and so that's a new edition coming out of that. And I'm very excited about that. That's one of my favorite um, books about tarot cards. Um, oh, it's and... very daring. It's a certain way kind of a bit Doom patrol -y, not not with heroes and comics, comic stuff, but just being the most daring book I ever wrote about tarot. Well, I have a plug for that book because wow. um, okay. everybody can get uh, the Doom Patrol omnibus from our store, MegaBrainComics.com. But I am guessing that that book you'll be able to get at Oblong. Um, I would, uh, I would imagine so. Yeah, I hope so. Which yeah, is, I'll... which is uh, one of the, uh, if not the coolest independent bookstore that you could ever find right here in Rhinebeck, New York. It's great. It's a really great store, and I feel so blessed that we have it. You know. Yeah, absolutely. And you, your store. Oh, thanks. Yeah, the coolest and... bookstore there is. <laughs> 
And uh, what about you, Elisa? Do you have uh, anything that you want to plug to uh, to the crowd? I do indeed. So just today, actually, I got my early advance uh, copies of Guilt. And Very wow. cool. This is Moisette's uh, cover. This is Jill Thompson's beautiful um, wow. yeah. alternate Love Jill cover. Thompson. Yeah, really. So this is... Uh, this is my, uh, I call it my, uh, the Golden Girls Meet Sex in the City by way of the Twilight Zone. <laughs> this is about a 70-something woman and her 49-year-old home health care aide who end up uh, traveling from the Upper West Side back to uh, 1973, wait, yes, 1973, and... Uh, in a time portal and they discover that their lives are linked in all kinds of uh, unusual wow. ways. A uh, guilt stands <coughs> for the guild of independent lady temporalists. Ah, great. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. So, well, so speaking uh, as a, speaking as a 70 something woman, um, I'm glad you're having a 70 something, 70 something woman hero. <laughs> yeah. I think that is very time cool. Traveler. I love that. I can't you know, wait to read breakers. it. Oh yeah. Time breakers is coming out. Time breakers. In my, my own, Comic book stuff, my God! So, so <laughs> oh my God, you forgot. <laughs> do with Felix um, called Time Breakers is coming out. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when. I, you know, and we're still, we are, we're still looking at finalizing the details, but it seems to me that they want to go ahead. Um, so that's that's a great thing who, going on. Who are you writing that for? Um, well, it's an old, it's, it's a Helix thing. It's going to be re a reprint. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. So oh, thing. yeah. And then. Um, and then also I'm doing, um, um, I think it's called Dynamite Comics, and I, it's called The Never-Ending Party, and Joe Corallo and I wrote it, and oh, um, nice. and he edited it, and so he, he had, the artist is great, and I, I, mean, I can't escape you right now. Um, anyway, but, so that's coming out, I'm not sure when, but that'll be a five issue. All right, very series. cool. Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, that will, whenever they, that hits solicitations, That'll yeah. end up on our shelves also. Yeah. And uh, and for anybody out there um, who who is interested in Rachel's omnibus, uh, Doom Patrol omnibus or uh, Elisa's first issue of Guilt, we are um, we have both of those available on MegabrainComics.com. And uh, if you order them, we'll we'll be sending you signed copies by uh, both of these lovely ladies and. Uh, if you order from our website right now, they are ten percent off. So you save some some mullions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> holy moly! Just, holy yeah. moly! <laughs> you say some holy simoleons. <laughs> yeah. Holy mula. Um, holy mula. That's a nice one. Yeah, yeah. Thank you both so much for oh, for doing this, Rachel. Pleasure. Thank you so much for thank for, you for yeah. like, Rachel coffee here. lunch. Yeah. We're talking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, and thanks everybody that um, that tuned in. And um, you know we're, we're going to be trying to do uh, a lot more of these um, kind of virtual events. In fact, I know somebody here that uh, we may be doing one with soon to promote a certain comic book uh, about <laughs> lady temporalists. Uh huh. Yay. <laughs> the is in the air. Oh, now my dog's about to knock over my my, my Doom Patrols, Rachel's Doom Patrols. Hello, Flappers. <laughs> Rowan, my dog always knows when an interview is coming to an end. He's like, food, food. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I get to eat soon. Um, but yeah, this was this was great. This was a lot of fun. And um, and yeah, the, even though it was live now, it will be available for everybody to uh, watch if they missed it on youtube facebook twitch or uh twitter all you have to do to go is go to one of those places and just search megabrain comics uh megabrain comics and then you'll you'll find this but then again if you're hearing me say that you're probably already watching this so um, wow that's mind-bending that is point, it's actually. like time travel <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good point actually <laughs> Um, <laughs> people to get these fish I've watched this. I've watched it. <laughs> <laughs> well, until next time, I until adore you time. both, and uh, and we'll see Good you. Uh, we'll see you around the way. Yeah. Good night, Wonderful. time travelers. Good 